Um, thank you very much to the first two speakers, actually. Or the first, yeah, it's, it's been phenomenal. And um, some of the things that were raised really touched me uh, and, and made me think of my work and what I'm about. Um, and so I haven't got a plan for this. And that was deliberate. I wanted to just speak to you um, about what it is that just makes me so very excited, what moves me day to day, what gets me up in the morning and send me, sends me to sleep at night happy. Um, I'm a medical student and medicine was a terrible idea. It was a really, really dumb idea. I'm not really interested in medicine. Um, when I was 16, I wanted to be, um, I wanted security, I wanted respect, um, I wanted all the things. I wanted girls, you know, everything. Um, and I just decided medicine, which I'm not sure really makes sense. Um, but nine years later, I realized how lucky I am because within medicine, I have found a passion, and it's, it's mental health. It is what goes on in our minds that really moves me. I think that the psyche, uh, the way that we think, and our internal worlds are as exotic and exciting as that beautiful picture of the Pacific that was painted earlier. Uh, they are as, as amazing, um, and we should venture into them. But of course, as we venture into them, uh, too often, some people don't come back, or they get lost for a while. On a personal note, I've had depression. It runs in the family. Um, it's in the genetics. There probably was no escaping it with it. But one of the great journeys of my life is to be to walk back from that edge that I went to, slowly, steadily, with careful steps, and not quite sure where the end was, where the middle was again, but slowly getting there. And as I've stepped back towards that, that middle that, for the most part, many of us stand in, um, I've, I've begun to look back to that edge. And I've begun to look back and see those people still there and realize that in having made that journey, I can go back and take them by the hand and walk them back to the middle, should they want to come, if they're ready. Now, mental health is a bit of a buzzword now, increasingly. I think that people are you know, turning onto it slowly. There is a great stigma, but it's a historical stigma. And I think that the next 50 years, we will see a revolution in the way that we think about thinking. And the way that we think about feeling, and the way that those two things interact and create behavior. And I think that that's really important, because we're pretty good at doing the external world. We're, our technology is fantastic, you know, we, we have a hundred messages a day on our iPhone, but if you can't rank those in order and think about where they're going to go and what's important in your life and why you should go to that one first or that thing over there, you just become stressed and that stress builds up in one way or another and it eventually results in, in breakdowns in some people, in those that are vulnerable, um, but also those that are not vulnerable, but are hit hardest by huge traumatic events. And our first speaker, speaker Yaron, um, talked about um, medicine, really, to my mind. A very different kind of medicine that we've become used to, the interventionist, surgical, drug-based medicine. But to me, it's a medicine. The, that ability to connect and to communi communicate and to express to somebody, anybody, your internal world and have them see it. And it's in those moments that we all, with our friends in the coffee shop or in front of a psychotherapist um, and a professional, that it's in those moments that we regularly, day to day, week to week, heal ourselves and grow. Now, my particular vein of research is a, is a little bit sexier, I guess, than the average psychotherapist. But I think that that's where the real work is done. I am uh, a neuroscientist, really. Um, I did a neuroscience degree not so long ago. Absolutely loved it. I wasn't the best neuroscientist. Um, but I got excited by, by a group of compounds, medicines, drugs, um, that work not in that traditional way. They work in the way that Yaron was talking about. Uh, they allow us to reach certain parts of ourselves. They're psychedelic drugs much maligned over the last 40 or 50 years by the war on drugs. Um, 
and seen as, as hard drugs and heavy drugs, things that do damage to us um, and, and ruin the individual um, and society with the individual, I think was the way that it was put across. Um, there are research units at UCL to a lesser extent, but at King's and Imperial that I'm involved with. Um, and our focus is using these drugs, LSD, psilocybin, uh, among others, and ayahuasca, which we've discussed a little bit, um, to, to open people up. So what we do is we, we take our patient who's been carefully assessed, um, and we, we do probably eight weeks of therapy, and there'll be eight after. And we take them into a room, we sit them down, we dress up the hospital room as nicely as we can because, let's face it, hospital rooms are awful and they are the worst place to try and take these drugs. Um, we put a little Buddha statue somewhere, you know, some ambient lighting, make it as really nice as we can. We work hard at this because it's probably one of the most important things about it. And we give them some headphones if they want music. We would have background music otherwise. And we sit them down and they take the drug, either a pill or an injection, depending on which one or what the research unit around us has dictated, because it's very hard to do these, these kind of trials. And they go on an experience. And I think what first comes to mind when you talk about these drugs, for so many people, and some of you will have tried them, I imagine. Um, some of you might have tried many. Some of you may not really heard of them is the Bad Trip Tent in Woodstock, where you know that mate of your mate who knows a guy who took two tabs of acid and went to high hell and was seeing monsters and never really was the same again. When we do this in a controlled setting, with a psychotherapist that the person trusts, that we've built trust with, in with the very specific attention of addressing what it is that they haven't been able to address in their life. Say they're depressed, say they're anxious, say they've got an addiction. Um, over the course of the experience, that thing comes up and for the most part there's very little done by the psychotherapist. For the most part, it's just that person on that experience, that trip, and there are moments of catharsis, there are moments of uh, confusion and, and immense emotionality as well. It's very easy work for the psychotherapist, actually, ironically. Um, but it, it transforms people in the most amazing way. And when you sit down with them 16 weeks later and they talk about taking a drug as the most important experience of their life to date, or perhaps the second or the third because they've had kids and they've got married, you know, and this is just dropping a pill. And then they talk about it not simply as an important experience, but as an experience that they are still growing from. That every day they think about, they go back to, they refer to, and they rethink the, the visions, the hallucinations um, that, that came up at the time. Perhaps I should have given a bit more context. As I say, this is unprepared. I should have given a bit more context about these drugs. They, are, uh, they produce hallucinations, changes in mood and perception. Um, they produce euphoria at times. Um, but they are, in a sense, all things to all people. You get out of your trip, um, in some sense, what you need. That's, that's how the shamans that give ayahuasca in, uh, in South America, or that's what they would say about it. It's, it's that you, you go into the experience and it gives you the plant, the, the vine, the, the synthetic LSD gives you what you need. Now, obviously as scientists and psychotherapists, we don't take such a spiritual view, but somehow it's right. Somehow, even in the worst moments when that monster looms over you, and the patient is unable to face it. It's in those moments, those bad trip moments, that they might have the insight, the momentary presence of mind to look that monster in the eyes, take a step forward towards it and give it a hug. Because that's what we're doing 
every time we sit in Costa with our friends and we decide to bring up that thing that we wanted to talk about, that thing that we really are here to say, that difficult thing that's going on at home, what Johnny, your kid, did yesterday. That's what we're doing every day. And it's all part of the process. And for these guys, this miraculous two-dose, and it does work, by the way, these drugs are remarkably effective. There are lots of lovely papers out there. That's what we're doing when we give them one little dose. It's just part of the journey of their recovery that, for me, took nine years. For them, may take two years, may take a lifetime. It's just part of a process, but a very... It's the fire. It's the hottest part of the fire on that process, is what it is. I've got to finish up.